In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. This is our fourth conference on the Second Evangelical Council, and as we've already laid everything out, um, this should fit right into, I hope, what you've been thinking, what you've been thinking about, what you've been praying about, what you've been reflecting about, about what is the religious life, what are the essentials of the religious life, what does it mean to be a religious these are the, all the things that are so important that maybe, maybe you've never heard before. But that's, that's the point of these conferences, and now we're on poverty. And as we have done each time, we look to the church. What does the church tell us about poverty? There's not another single aspect of consecrated religious life on which the church, through canon law, with such devotion, speaks more of than the practice of evangelical poverty. So let's look at canon law. The Evangelical Council of Poverty, in imitation of Christ, who for our sake was made poor when he was rich, entails a life which is poor in reality and spirit, sober and industrious, and a stranger to earthly riches. It also involves dependence and limitations in the use and disposition of goods in accordance with each institute's own law. There's almost too much there. Now you can see I've already started to break it down. But again, poverty in imitation of Christ, who for our sake was made poor when he was rich, entails a life which is poor in reality and in spirit, sober and industrious, and a stranger to earthly riches. And it involves dependence and limitations dependent upon the constitutions and the rules of our of each community, not just ours. So, a lot there. So, we're, like always, we're going to break it down. For our life, for what we do, it's fitting. It's absolutely fitting that we be poor. Why? Because we look to our Lord, who is poor. Let's go to our founder, however. In his rule that he wrote, the Norma Vita, as you can see, it's so important. Because since, you know, the next one is going to be obedience, but this is what our founder says. Okay. This is Norma Vitae, published in 1683. Obedience guards chastity, and poverty nourishes chastity. Now, our last conference was chastity, and how difficult that is. Sometimes one can get the impression from talking to other religious, talking to maybe even other priests, that chastity is easy, and we know it's not. And that's why the last conference was so difficult because it's not easy. And so our founder recognizes that the councils themselves will help you with chastity. So he'll say later uh, in his other writings that I've read that if you're having a problem with chastity, that's all right. Be obedient. Be poor. If you do those two things, that'll take care of the rest. Very important because so many people, so many um, uh, religious really struggle with chastity. And sometimes they're told, well, you're not called. You don't have the gift. And you, I've heard that. Well, celibacy, chastity is gifts, and if you can't do it, well, then you're not called. Not true. It's not true. Obedience guards chastity, and poverty nourishes chastity. So, what is it exactly that is consecrated poverty? The church calls our poverty the Evangelical Council of Poverty, just like the Evangelical Council of Chastity we talked about. Why? Because it's in the Evangelium. It comes from the Gospel. Consecrated poverty, therefore, is evangelical because it's taught not only in the four Gospels, but throughout the New Testament. And with emphasis, taught by the Holy Spirit writing through St. Luke, who wrote 
the Acts of the Apostles, the early way of the church, and how they practiced poverty, and how they came together, giving up everything, so that all had something. This was the practice. They, women voluntarily became impoverished, practically impoverished. It's not just quoted words that are part of, of, uh, of the scripture, the revelation in scripture. It's also the facts of history. We know that of the early church. Consecrated poverty is accountable, but to distinguish it from the precept and what a consequential, therefore religious, are to go beyond the commandment, as we've talked about, more the commandment of poverty as found in divine revelation. The religious always wants to do more. So it can't just be even giving up what you have. It can't just be selling what you have. It can't be being part of a community that's poor. You want to do more. You want, how can I give more? And it's always going to be in those simple ways. All of us can do more with poverty. On either side, practically, or in the spirit of poverty. In the Old Testament, demands poverty. In where where does it demand poverty? Where do we get that from the Old Testament? Several times in the, in the Pentateuch, the prohibition not to steal and not to covet. So, at that time, the Archbishop Sheen told a story. Uh, he was visiting um, a very um, some is probably somewhere some island somewhere of people that were just hearing the Gospels. It's probably the 40s or 50s, 1940s, 1950s. And he's visiting this village, and he's teaching them. And he's teaching them the Ten Commandments. And he goes over B, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not cover thy neighbor's states. And later, they came to him, and they said, what does that mean? Why would anybody want to steal from somebody else? Why would anybody want what someone else has or desire for someone else? They didn't understand because in their culture, they supported each other. They didn't know what stealing was or what coveting was. And he was amazed. They, they, they couldn't grasp the concept of it. If only we could think that way. And maybe that's what the religious life should do with, with poverty. How could you ever think of taking? What do we want to do? Giving. How do I give more? How do I give of myself? Poverty is not simply the lack of. In fact, I think it's not that at all. It's not the lack of. It's what I have so much more. I recognize how much I have. Even in, in the little that maybe the world might see and, and look at you and uh, I, you know, one of the brothers at the at the uh, Kamalovis, who I sat next to, I looked down, and half of his sandal was duct tape. And I'm looking at it. I mean, literally, it's mostly duct tape. Now, as a formator, I look at that in two ways. Is he not asking for something he needs? Or is he being really humble about it, you know, maybe they'll notice. Had they already tried and he said, no, I'm fine? I don't know. But what I do know is that he's doing it. But how many of us, when our sandals start to feel bad, oh, I need more sandals. This guy put just puts duct tape on it. So I, at least from an external way, I can look at that as a way. He gave me something. By looking at that, I received something. I recognized that in him. He didn't mean to. I don't, I don't think. But he did give me some. So how much more he gives by what he has, by people who practice poverty. In the New Testament, this is the commandment the followers of Christ, our Lord, are obliged to share with those in need. But if I share with someone in need, what's if you share with someone in need, What's the implication? That you give something up. Because sharing is not, the, the virtue of sharing cannot be, I have uh, four potatoes, I only get to eat one, so let me go give this away. That's worldly virtue. 
Okay, sharing from a part, an impoverished uh, spirit of poverty is when you give of what you have, which is not much at all. That you're willing to share um, the food that you have, even though you don't have a lot anymore. You know, I and I don't use my own examples because I don't want to make it sound like I'm uh, propping somebody up. But you know, I grew up poor. We were a poor. We had a poor, we were a poor family. Most of the time, we didn't know it. It wasn't until I became a teenager that we realized, oh, we're really poor. But I remember being poor. I remember watching my mom and my dad worry about paying bills. My dad always worked, but he was uneducated. So. There was a time when the next door neighbors um, had their electricity turned on and their water turned on. I didn't know it was because they didn't pay any bills. I just knew that they didn't have. And my dad was a tough guy. Um, maybe some didn't see, see him as the nicest guy. And maybe I didn't even see him as the nicest guy growing up. But even the neighbors who were probably prejudice, and we were the only Mexican family living in this neighborhood. But they were kind of mean to us. But my dad heard that happened, so he ran an extension pool from our house over to their house. He ran a water hose from our house over to their house. I didn't know. I didn't really understand at the time. But it was no question to him, despite how they treated us, that, oh, you, that can't be. You can't let that happen. Now, I'm sure my mother thought of him on. Maybe she didn't, I don't know. But I still remember that. And my dad didn't worry about the electric bill, about the water bill. He just knew they didn't have it. That's what it means, as I see now. And of course, you know, my father's been dead now almost five years. Um, Archbishop, again, Archbishop Sheen would teach that all the memories, good and bad, and maybe so many bad, but all those memories all of a sudden become like precious jewels that you hold on to, these lessons that my father still teaches me, even though he's been gone from this earthly life for five years now. It's really quite amazing if you're able to recognize what, who, I mean, I didn't know that God was going to teach me through my father when I was so young, when I'm so old. I think I'm old. Now, it's, it's really, and, and this is, I think, can, is another idea of what it means to be impoverished. And then with our Lord in the gospel, this is interesting because recently, you know, recently I mean, I mean academically when I, when I say that recently, which last five, ten years recently, there's been this argument of whether there's anybody in hell. And I've seen it, I've seen it answered and argued and back and forth of this and that. Okay. But I've never seen anybody take this particular story, and it doesn't mean I've seen everything, but uh, the story of Devas. I don't know if you know who Devas is in the Holy Gospel. Where Devas comes from. Um, but Devas is the name given to the rich man. Who Lazarus is the poor man filled with sores that sits at the door begging his entire life. The rich man never gave him anything. Okay. Where does the rich man end up? Most translations will say something like the abyss. From the abyss, he sees Father Abraham. And he sees Lazarus after he died, there at the bosom of Father Abraham. Father, allow Lazarus to dip his finger in the water just to relieve me for a moment. Where is he? He's in hell. There's the proof right there. Right in the gospel. He's in hell. So, our Lord condemns him to hell. Why? Because he was rich and never gave to the poor right in front of him. Only now that, well now I know, please go to my brothers and tell them, no, they're not going to listen to anybody because they're just like you. And the importance of poverty, this man, Jesus, didn't steal anything. He just refused to share. How many rich do you know like that? Yeah, you know, I'm a good person. I don't steal. I follow the law. I don't share. They're condemned. They're condemning themselves. But our consecrated poverty, the religious poverty, goes beyond the commandment. 
not to steal, not to covet, and the commandment to share. So as we go on reflecting on the church's explanations of, of what this means, we'll see that beyond, but beyond, beyond more, what it means to be more in power. So we look at our example, we look at our Lord. He became poor for our sake. Because the poverty is undertaken in the imitation of our Lord. He became poor for our sake. This is the fundamental motive for the practice of consecrated poverty. Our Lord, the all-possessing God, who made the universe, to whom everything belongs, yet we believe he became poor for our sake, poor although he was rich. But he became poor. That's what the nativity is all about, what Bethlehem is all about. Our Lord, the infant, they are wrapped in rags. When we, when, when, so when we say that he became poor for our sakes, we are to become poor for his sake. And I've seen it in my own former congregation as much as I love them, and you know that I love them, but I've seen it, that people ostensibly, ostensibly living a life of poverty will not be as faithful in the practice of the council. They, they lose the faith. You've got to practice poverty. And as I shared with you before, I've heard this, well, you know, I already gave up everything. So I'm in the religious life, so I don't need to wear a habit. I don't need to wear my clericals. I don't need to, to practice any more poverty. I've already given everything up. It's not true. It, you'll never make it. It is our Lord's poverty that is the source of our poverty. It was his practice of poverty which merited the grace for us to even undertake a life of evangelical poverty. It's his poverty that's the standard and the norm of how we should live. And it's tough, but every day when we do our examination of conscience, when we do it together and when you do it individually, you've got to ask yourself about this. You've got to ask yourself if you're living poor. Now, being obedient, you don't get to choose. So, if I see you with worn down sandals, you already know. They've already been old. I've already bought you some. You don't get to choose, no, I won't wear these. That's part of obedience. But I may say to you, you may say, um, brother, I need, I need more pants. Really? Why? Well, these are starting to wear down. Good. Let's repair them. When you go to the Solanus Casey Center and you look at his habit, what do you see? You see a habit filled with repairs. This is my newer habit, but the other one, this one's beginning to look like the other one. The other one, you'll look and you'll see repairs. As long as we can repair it, we're going to repair it. I know, uh, you brought to me things. This has got a hole. Okay, we'll fix it. Eventually, of course, you know, you can't walk around in public in rags because Father Stanis also said it. You have to be clean. St. Dominic would say that about the Dominicans. There's no, Father Founder would say that there's no such thing as dirty poverty for a religious. Be clean. Clean the habits. Clean yourself. Now, that's opposed and that, you know, you know how much I love the Franciscans. They don't think that you can be dirty, be barefoot. Your habit can be dirty. That's, that's part of it for them. Ours is different, especially our white habit in honor of Our Lady and Immaculate Conception. It's got to be clean. Now, sometimes you see spots, and that's why we have those bleach pins and fix the spots. But otherwise, we have to be clean. Always, 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 this poverty is, must be animated by love. There's no way that you can be impoverished without love to give more. Let's look at actual poverty 
and poverty of spirit. This is something that's argued about in religious communities all the time. Well, we might have lots of things, like I know of a religious community that has a beautiful residence. It's a mansion. Everything in there is beautiful. The kitchen, all the best stuff. Well, we're poverty in spirit. Okay. And you go to a religious community, a religious community, and you'll see nice things. And even myself, you know, in preparing this conference, I have ta I've talked about the need of a van. We need a van because we're growing. When we go shopping, you know, we need places to put that. And I've even told you, I've showed you, you know, that van would be very nice. There's no way. As I'll continue to talk about. Because our poverty is to be actual poverty and poverty of spirit. The church carefully identifies uh, the consecrated poverty as both actual and spirit. And it's crucial, as we read in the canon, where it says, entails a life which is poor in reality and in spirit. So let's look at the two. Poverty of spirit. It's expressed in a very specific way in the Holy Gospel. And I bet if you were able to speak, you could guess. Where would it be? Do you know? Where would it be so clearly laid out in the Holy Gospel about poverty of spirit? And I'm looking at one of them. It's the first reality. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And as we talked about chastity, that, that the evangelical practice of chastity, when we're doing it in the ideal way, is what? The witness of the kingdom of heaven. And so again, we're here with poverty of spirit. Bless, blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Right now, in everything that you do, the people that you see, the people that you meet, the people that you counsel, the people that come to you, they'll see that. And you're witnessing the kingdom of heaven. It's, it's profound to me. To be poor in spirit is to be poor interiorly, even though I may be wealthy. There's several saints that we can look to. St. Elizabeth of Hungary comes to mind. She, she's, she was, um, had everything. She was worried. But you never know. She gave everything to her, helping the poor. So many saints, especially women saints, were like that. Uh, uh, St. Louis, the king. He was poor in spirit. He was the king. Had everything before him. But well, there's a reason why he's a saint. He lived poor in spirit. To be poor in spirit means to be interiorly detached, to be interiorly free from inordinate love of money or earthly goods. To be poor in spirit means to be poor in heart. Now, I've asked you during this retreat to refrain from accessing the kitchen or, or refectory snack area. To just receive. This is why. To practice. Even though you may not feel it, to practice. I'm just going to receive. I'm going to eat what I've been given. To practice being poor in spirit. Both the rich and the actually poor are to be poor in spirit. Because those who possess things, it means not to be jealous, not to hoard what they've got. It means to be ready to give. It means to be ready to share. I, some of you know that I was in this house in San as a young man, and I was well younger than you, I was child's age. And I remember there was a family who, they kind of adopted me. Seminarians, one or two, they bring them over on the weekends, they do things for them. And I remember talking to him, and I remember his name, I'm going to say his name, but Ted Hornick, him and his wife, Pat Hornick, uh, from Dallas. And their family would always help us. And I remember sitting at the table with him, and he said to me, because he had a beautiful home, lots of stuff, and it's obviously they had money, and they lived in um, an area of Dallas that was fairly well. And he said, well, you know, God gave us more, so we want to give more. Begin. 
very simple lesson that maybe I'm not appreciating until now. He knew that. He knew, but we have more so we're ready to give him. I've also met people that have a lot and don't give anything. That this was, he was practicing, a late person practicing being poor in spirit. And so, for those who don't possess, and that's most of the people on this earth, they do have to be poor in spirit. It means not to envy what others have. Poverty of spirit prohibits jealousy in those who have. Prohibits envy in those who have not. And this poverty of spirit is so difficult to practice. Poverty in reality or actual, or actual poverty is the key to consecrated poverty. It assumes that a person either actually possesses things or has a right to possess, but voluntarily gives up. Not only, not only in one's heart, but in your hands. Voluntarily gives it up. I know. I, mean, I know you will. I know there's things you can do. I don't tell you because you have to do it. I could tell you, list them off, and you do it. It's not coming from here. It's coming from here. The hope is that with good guidance, good counsel, that you begin to see. And there's no greater joy I have than when I don't want to do something that I'm really to do. And you finally, it may take months to do it. That's great joy for me, because what came from your heart? It came from you. But that takes a part of it. Let's talk about it. So if you wish to be perfect, now, our Lord could have not been more plainer when remembering his conversation with who the rich young man. And our Lord made it sure that this parable, this lesson, came from a rich young man. Following, if you wish to be perfect. Now, what we have to understand, and I think maybe we can we can talk about it, because it's one of my favorite stories, because my favorite line, if we, if we think about, of course I'm paraphrasing. So the rich young man comes over, and I have the image from the movie Jesus of Nazareth. And you see this rich young man, princely, clean, pristine clothes. His beard is trimmed. It's oiled. You can tell it's been oiled, and it's, it's glistening. And he comes over. Lord, I have kept all the commandments. I've done everything. Look at me. What else must I do to gain eternal life? And I bet he was he wanted to hear do, 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 do. good go, keep on. And oh, how does our Lord answer? He says, Go, sell all you have, give to the poor, and come and follow me. But the phrase just before that is my favorite. The Lord looked at him and loved him. And I always think, what a tender, beautiful gaze that must have been. Because you can see, he's, he's a good kid. That's how it is. He's a good kid. He's doing good things. But there's more. Like one young man I know, who seems to be that way. And I told him, I think you need to get a He also went away sad. And he goes away sad because he can't do it. And our Lord knew how he was going to answer him. He couldn't do it. And it's the end. And then come and follow me is the difference between survival and dissolution of many religious communities. Because remember that in this, in this story from, from the Gospel, the Lord is not telling the young man, that he has to do this to keep out of hell. Chances are, he's okay. He's doing enough. The Lord is saying, I want more from you. You can do more. That's going to involve what? Complete surrender. Complete giving up. And when you can do that, 
It's freedom. But St. Matthew adds, well, when the young man heard these words, he went away sad, for he was a man of great wealth. Actual poverty is objective poverty. It is real poverty. It is external poverty. It is sensibly perceptible poverty. It's physical and not only psychological. I hope you're getting what it means. And as, as I was preparing the retreat, I can say this should be a bit. Are we living in poverty? That's why I said, no, we, we can't get a new man. How, how would that look? Now, if someone wants to, date, to donate an old meet up van, okay, that looks, that's what we need. In the building up of this new community formation, there's so much we need. So you'll see new things come in. But that's the last time you're going to see it until it's completely used up. Even now, you know, wouldn't it be, one could make the argument, look at yourselves. Is the desk perfect? Probably not. Is the area perfect? No. In these winters in Detroit, does it get really cold? Yes. Do you have a carpet? Yeah. Sure. It reminds me of, the, of, the, of uh, one of our patrons, Blessed Teresa of Calcutta, so maybe St. Teresa of Calcutta. And they were opening uh, the Missionaries of Charity House, Charity House in San Francisco. And they chose a very poor area. You know, if you've ever been around Missionaries of Charity, it's really something. I've always admired them. Always, always admired the Missionaries of Charity and, and, and Blessed Mother Teresa. And they were so proud, you know, to show them another come in. And, and they were very simple rooms. Very simple rooms. And she saw and she looked and she got on her knees and started to tear the carpet out. And I said, Mother, we just have all this installed where it's very simple carpet. She said, Do the people living around here have carpet? Tear it out. Get rid of the air conditioners. Do, people, do you see the people around here with air conditioners? Get rid of them. Because they had to show their poverty, real poverty. And even uh, several years ago, I went to Ecuador, to Guayaquil, to live amongst, I mean, we don't know what poor is in this country. Maybe, maybe some places like Appalachia. Maybe. But we went there, and the intent was to take these college students on spring break, it was called alternative spring break, and to live, but to live like them. Now, the house that we were in was much better. It actually had running water, you know. But most of these people lived literally in cardboard shacks that they called home, where they raised their children, where every day they didn't have a refrigerator, every day they were looking for food. How do people, how does that, that even happen? But remember when I said that poverty, poverty of spirit is not envying or being jealous. So what I found even more amazing is they were happy. We look at them from the Western world, from the modern world, from the first world as it's called, to the third world, and we say, how dare you not, how dare the world look by and you don't have all these things? And we change them for the worse when they're perfectly happy. What does our Lord say? The poor will be with you always. So even around here, all the poverty we see around here, we can't fix it. What we can do is walk around, be friendly, talk to people. And that's happened. We've been walking around here. People come along, maybe not so friendly sometimes, but we try to be friendly. And we'll do more of that as we continue on. We'll do more when we're walking around. Not to proselytize, but that's God's work. He may use us, but to simply be witnesses as we talk about. Witnesses, external witnesses. Miracles happen. Just like I still remember this little family that was over here, the little kids. 
So you guys weren't here yet. But I was walking around the neighborhood. I didn't have a car. So I, I told you this story about me walking three miles to have because I had to go buy insurance. And I'm walking back and um, there was the two times when I had to go to the bank, which is like five miles away. And so I walked. And this time it's from insurance. I'm walking. People, I would see people pass by with their phones. Filming. And of course I'm thinking maybe I'm on YouTube somewhere. But they're because they they they, they wonder. Daniel says I look like a wizard. People are wondering, what is that? What is that person? But it, but sometimes they'll walk up to you. Who are you? I, I remember so well of going up in down Russia, walking up in down Russia. I couldn't walk 50 yards without being stopped. I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm a Catholic religious. Oh, will you pray for me? Sure, sure, because I'm really having a hard time. Sometimes right there. I pray with them, keep walking. And what, and that's what happens. That's what we that's part of our life. It's simply being witness, being able to show people who we are by simply what they see. And they will come. That's how our lady sends people to us. But that's part of our practice of poverty. We have nothing. We're not walking around with pockets full of money. Oh, let me buy some food for the kids. Let me do this. We don't do that. We be friendly. I, I probably didn't tell you because we've been in silence. But, um, well, I think I did. Yesterday, going to pick up fruit and vegetables. And the atheist walks up to me. What kind of get up is that? No, I'm, I'm, I'm Catholic religious. This is a religious habit. Oh, I'm an atheist. Oh, good, I'll pray for you. And his response, I'll think for you. Good, think for me, please do. Think good thoughts. But who knows? He may go away from that thinking, hmm, that was actually kind of nice. We had an experience once being at uh, uh, that market, I forget what it's called. And we were sitting there just having a quick dinner, slice, maybe a slice of pizza that had been out all day. And this guy walks up, very nice man. He had a very, his background, Buddhists and all kinds of things. But no, I don't believe in God. You know, I don't, you know, it's all here. A very nice guy. And we invited him here. We said, hey, why don't you come over for dinner sometime? Not to proselytize, because he's a nice guy. It's nice talking with him. But again, what could that lead to? That's part of being poverty in spirit. We have so much. I'm not out there trying to spoon feed people. Maybe there's a time for that. But we just simply being who we are. So remember that, again, actual poverty is objective poverty, real poverty, external poverty, sens sensibly perceptible poverty, physical, not only psychological. I have another story. I remember, uh, you know, that when, when our good friends, the Nunes family, donated the pony. And I finally had a car to drive. And one of the bridal parishioners stopped me, and she wanted to ask me some questions. And so... I rolled down the window. And she said, oh, that's real poverty. Because what cars have, do you have to roll down the window anymore? And it usually got a man. But it reminded me, oh, yeah, I guess so. It is real poverty. And I drove that Pontiac um, to on our retreat. It's, it's great, even though it's, it's an old car. But that shows real poverty. The cruiser, you know, this, that's what we have that as well. Not great. That's why we're not going to get any sort of wheels for it, or rims or hubcaps. It would look nicer, but we don't have them. Okay, so what? You know, we're not walking, we're not running around trying to attract attention anyway. And maybe this is a good segue to the next point. Consecrated poverty is sober. And even, it's kind of a strange word to apply to poverty. But it's literally, it's a literal translation of the Latin. That's what it means, sober. So what kind of poverty is sober poverty? It means that our poverty is to be controlled, even-tempered, well-balanced, tempered in action and thoughts. There's a word, satiate. Our poverty should satiate, satisfy. 
it should not be intoxicating. It should be sober. So there's great wisdom in the Latin of the church chose. It should be so. And so how practically, how, what does that mean? We're not Buddhists or Hindus. We believe that poverty, that poverty is a means to an end. The end being a more perfect love of God. There's no inherent value in itself in not having. <clears throat> it's the reason why. Why are we doing that? We're not to consider possessions as of themselves sinful or evil, nor are we to look on those who may be wealthy as living in sin. Or maybe in a word, we're not angry with the rich Marxism of intoxicating poverty, hating wealth. That's what it is. Hating wealth. That's intoxicating poverty. That's not who we are. Poverty is so. That's why. I can look at you and say, well, you can't wear that shirt anymore. Or it might be coming from you. You cannot wear those boxers anymore. Because they're falling apart. Now, if you don't, you don't, the others you won't know this, that I do the laundry in the house. I don't allow my guys to do the laundry. Why? It's a way of me being of service. I have to practice that as well. So I see everything. So I, you can't wear those anymore. But I want to, they're still, they'll still, they still do the job. No, it's time to get rid of those. We'll get you more. So that would be intoxicated poverty. The shirt that's no longer protecting me the way it should. Maybe even the habit is torn. No longer the pockets are no longer moving. I can't repair that anymore. That would be intoxicated. It's not, it's not so, it's not well-intentioned. Poverty also means that we're hardworking. And consecrated poverty, the church tells us, remember, we're always looking at the church, always from the example of Father Founder, always in the church, with the church, for the church, for the greater glory of God. So we're still looking at the church. Poverty in the church, what well, poverty the church tells us, and this is important, obliges us to be industrious. Poverty obliges us to be industrious. Religious are to be hardworking. And, you know, it's just something that I, I've stressed for years. We cannot be people of leisure. Religious are not to be people of leisure. Ease, comfort, leisure. For religious, if you're feeling it, it's a sin. You can't be that way. If you're walking around going, oh man. I remember there was a, a brother with my former congregation. He was from the Philippines. And I had already been there a few years, and everyone knew my thoughts about how we were living. And um, he came along, and I remember he was a novice. And he said, ah, this life is like cotton candy. And everybody kind of looked at him because he was kind of a funny guy, and people always nod to him. And he loved the religious life at this point. But he said, and you say, say, what do you mean? Compared to life in the Philippines, this is great. This is there's nothing to me. Well, you know what? That wasn't good. Not for him. He was living a life of leisure. So for each person, it's going to be a little bit different. If for me, I have to watch it, as I've told you, coming from a poor background. Sometimes I look at what we have and I think, wow, we've got abundance. This is great. What do you, what do you want? You don't like uh, tangerines? You'd rather have nectarines? Okay, let's go buy some. Oh, you feel like McDonald's? Okay, let's go. Yeah, I don't think so. It's, a, it's really an awakening. The preparation is true. Is that, it's not that you can't do it, is it being so is it the right time? I remember uh, when, I, when I, the years I was in my former congregation and I would look forward to travel because we got to go to it. Nothing big, but you could ask the question, wasn't there food at the house? Why didn't you make sandwiches? But I guarantee you, when we traveled, as kids, which is rare, we, we never stopped in. I, I may have not shared with some of you at this point, but I didn't have a steak 
until I was well into my twenties. And I really didn't even know what it was. All I knew was hammer meat. And I and when we had spaghetti, we never had spaghetti meatballs. I didn't even know that it was a woman. My mom would have her pound, pound and a half of hamburger meat, and she would make the spaghetti meat sauce. And I used to get so mad at my older brother because if he got to the first, he picked out all the meat. And we just get the little bits. That's all I knew. And so sometimes here, you know, you eat well. If I cook, you know, you're going to eat well. But sometimes we have to look at that. You are we being poor. But you can't be intoxicated. You can't say, well, I'm not buying anything. And all there is is Pop Tarts, so you're just going to have to eat Pop Tarts until they're gone. That's, of course, you can't do that either. But we have to be industrious. We can't be men of leisure. Because why? What do poor people do? Mul truly poor people. They work. Because they have to. I'm not talking about the people who don't work and rely on the government. No. And again, I, I can only use my own examples. My dad would have never accepted the offer. Although he was out, we were at Algebra Vault. He would not do it. And even the stores, I remember my mom telling me the story. One time, when we were living in California, that was, I was on money before at the time. They had to take the off. And at that time, when you received that, a social worker would come by to see what you do, what you're really poor. And my mom says that the social worker commented, she couldn't believe it. Her house is so clean, the kids are clean, they're cooking. Her husband's at work because she didn't usually see it. But that was the only time because there was that need. But there were many times growing up, I'm sure, that we could have used it. You know, even talking about being poor, and of course these are lessons I'm learning now, but I remember when when we moved to Houston and my dad we moved to this house, because we were living with relatives at that time. And I remember watching my dad build a kitchen table. Because that was, that's what the poor do. You can't go buy a five hundred dollar table from the local furniture place. You have to go buy some plywood and some two by wood and, and make what you have. I thought that's what everybody did. I had no idea that that's being poor. So even here, I know that we can find ways to practice poverty and move on. And why? And when I say it, you, you don't know this, but I feel it in my heart. There's a joy. What? Because why? Because I think I'm a true religious. I want to do more. What more can I do? But if we had to, I mean, what more could we do? It doesn't mean getting rid of things. As you know, we don't have a lot of stuff. Everything we have is used. Come from somewhere else. But what more can we do? Maybe something like when we, somebody keeps leaving squash at our door. So maybe we should do it. Aside from God, rather than saying, I don't even like squash. Quit leaving this at my door. But yet, they kept doing it. Maybe, maybe we should. So, either we're serious about following our Lord, or we're not. It's one or the other. This comes from St. Ignatius. Two, two choices, the two banners. And as he explains it in his, in his um, meditations, that on one side is the banner of our Lord. On the other side is the banner of the Lord. Choose. Where do most people end up? This is not the end of the middle. In the battle. And they're choosing. That's the wrong place. You've got to choose. Because what does Revelation tell us? Either be hot or cold, or lukewarm, I'll spit out. That's horrifying, terrifying. When I think about that, am I lukewarm in my pocket? I hope not. Do I want it? And it comes down to simple things, simple, simple, simple things that you can do. That's why I've been saying, during the retreat, truly mortify yourself. You see, I use this example all the time, it means nothing. If you're having toast and you see the jelly or the jam, maybe only use a little bit. 
rather than what can usually God them on because it's there. Or don't use it all. Only out of love, though. And you've got to feel it in here. It's part of what it means to be industrious because our Lord worked. In fact, the Latin Vulgate translation of the Greek identifies our Lord as the reputed son of a, I bet you've never heard this word before, of a favor. That's the liberal translation, a favor. A hard-working laboring man. That's who he was the son of. That's why they said, isn't he the son of the carpenter? Because he was nothing. That's like saying, isn't he the son of the garbage man? And he's the anointed one? No way. Who is this our Lord that we're following? It's on these premises only that we shall give the witness that the church wants us religious to give to the poor and even in wealthy America. Because there's much, much extensive and dire poverty. And learning this, as you know, my own spiritual director, who was a companion for years with Mother Teresa, he'll tell me this, her dire poverty, her recognition of the destitution. And where did she want a house? Most especially when there was so much poverty, so much destitution of spirit. Where was it that she wanted that house? And you would think, not there. The house is there now. It's full. Some great work is going on there through what she started. Even you can look at so many cities, even here. You walk around here and look at it, and you can look out and you can see downtown Detroit. The rich. Right in the face. I remember even going to Black Hill. And you're looking at, as far as you can see, these cardboard shanties. And right behind it, a water park for the rich. Right there in, in front of them. How those kids must look. But, you, but the other thing that I, I saw too, I remember when they said, um, we're going to play soccer. We have our soccer matches today. And you know what? As poor as they were, every kid had a uniform. Every kid had their soccer uniforms. Not fancy or anything, just different colors, but a number. And they said, well, come. Come see us play soccer. So I'm thinking I'm going to a field, a soccer field. I'm thinking, well, that's nice because the whole place is tested. There's nothing there. And so they take me, and they're so proud of the soccer field. It is the pride of the little community. It's made a crush time. And I'm, I'm looking, going, you play soccer on that? What if you fall? Oh, yes, we fall all the time. You know, look, it cuts. Because if you fall, you're going to get cut on crush concrete, you're going to get cut. But that, they were so happy to play on that. Not looking at the beautiful water. That's right there, that's being built. They're so happy in that little place. So even with us being surrounded with what we're surrounded by, this is an oasis. In our little place, this little monastery, maybe not so big, a little yard, a little garden, our farm down the street, the cemetery, our wonderful pastor and associate pastor, the church, the chapels, how rich we are, how truly rich what we have. But how do we become more poor like our Lord? Because that's what we're following. Through work. Work is the answer. And the hardest effort we have to expand is not only with the body, and you know this, it's not just with the body. It's with the mind and with the will. That's and the emotion. That's the work. And here, especially at this point of your formation, you know and no one understands. No one knows what we go through. The hours. Just sometimes the ugliness that we have to look at. It's really hard work. So sometimes, yeah, at this point, we're not doing a lot of physical things. We're doing more. But that's because we're doing a lot of hard work. And only God knows that. And that's okay. 
because it's also to pray as we should, to love as we should, to care as we should, to be kind and gentle as we should. That all means work, laboring to conquer our distinctively selfish ego. That's work. That's what this, this, this part is about, the hard work. In connection, hard work is sobering. So we also must be a stranger. A stranger to what? To earthly riches. We have to be a stranger to them. I don't know what it means. Before you guys came along, some of my benefactors, they loved to take me out to eat. And I remember the first time, and they took me to this amazing Italian restaurant here in Detroit. Um, Antiano's. Delicious. But linens, silverware, you know, crisp, clean waiters, everything that you can imagine. Sumptuous. And I was so embarrassed to be there. They didn't understand. Oh, brother, it's okay. You never go anywhere. We want to treat you. Okay. But I, I really didn't want to be there. You can't go to places like that. Seeing a group of brothers at a McDonald's having a burger, that's probably okay. Even better, on the side of the road with their breweries, having a lunch that was packed before they left. That's even better. We can't know what influences. We have to know that to remind ourselves, we have to remind ourselves that being a stranger to earthly riches is both for each of us and for our community. That's why the example of what the question's been asked, what if someone donated a brand new band? I mean, I hope they would talk to me about it. Um because I might say, I mean, you know, because the argument comes in things like this. Well, you've got to have something reliable. You do retreats. You go to the store. Oh, that's true. Okay. Then what do you do? What I might do is say, well, okay, but no air conditioning. No, nothing automatic. In fact, I want to stick shit. Strip it of everything. The engine will be good, we'll know that, we'll know we can rely on, but strip it of everything. Because probably they want to give you everything. And that's why hopefully they talk to you about it. So even though we have to be we have to be a stranger to those things, even though it's very nice. You know, it's nice to be in the cruiser and be able to just push a button and the window goes down. Rather than to be in the Pontiac and you don't have to and the Pontiac's older, so things are starting to buckle and things like that. The seats aren't so good. I found out on my trip, I had to get a pillow to sit on because the seats aren't good anymore. You know, they were 20 years old, almost 20 years old. The pillow helped a lot, you know, my bag. And I thought, why not go and buy um, support? Please sell them. Well, I've got a pillow. That's, that's what works fine. Those, that's the way we have to think. To be a stranger to those things. It's not enough for just of us as individuals to practice poverty. We have to do so as a community to avoid even giving the appearance of wealth. We look to the poor and to the people coming into them, and they I want them to say, I feel comfortable this community practices what it preaches. I've had people come in here, you know, because we've had receptions and we've had guests come in, and they'll look, oh, we're going to get you paint, and we're going to do this, and we're going to do that. It's okay. We're okay. You know, uh, one of the on the third floor, uh, there's a sink hanging off the wall. But we have eight other sinks. It's not like you know we need to fix it right now. So it's okay because it costs money. The second floor, there's problems. There's a toilet that we can't use in the second floor. But there's other toilets. It's not like it's the only one. All these things mean something. Poverty has to be dependent. And what does that mean? Dependence on whom? 
Poverty means that, especially for you, to be dependent on who? The community. To furnish for your superior, to provide. On other members of the community, to share. On people outside of the community, to donate. We have to rely on by divine providence. That's what Father Founder talked about all the time. The story. I think you might have heard this already, but I'll tell it again. We're mendicants. We're beggars. We rely on divine providence. That's the way Father Founder wanted. As I told you, I sometimes I, I don't know. We have bills. We have to buy food. I try not I try to get you whatever you ask for. But it costs money. The habits cost money to me. Everything. We're buying it on time. We're relying on divine providence. It's not easy, especially for me sometimes. But Father Founder was there at the monastery in the Corbia Forest in Poland. And there were some brothers walking back from the city. And they thought, oh, let's go collect money for it because we need it. We need to buy food. Father will be so pleased. Let's go do that. And so they go and they knock on the doors and they you know, pull out their hands. People will give them whatever. And so they're walking back. They're walking back to the monastery. There's a little lake there. And they see Father Founder come. Where have you been? Oh, Father, look. We went, look at all this money we got. And he looked at it, and he took it from them, from them, and he threw it in the lake. And the lake boiled. He said, see, there's your soul. You did not have permission to go out and ask for money. What were they not doing? They were not relying on their superior. I will get it for you. And if I need you to do that, I'll ask you. The obedience, which we're going to talk about in the next conference. So it's got to be dependent. And that takes, what does dependence take? Humility. It takes humility to know, I just have to do it. Because and it, it takes not just humility, but trust in a mutual love and affection. Because you should be able to say, I know he loves me. He's not going to not notice that I need this. When, when we have it, He'll give it to you. But that takes a lot. That's way, way, way beyond that you get to that point. Because that's how we should look at our world. That when struggles, problems, whatever's going on, we should be able to look at him. I know you're not going to leave me alone. I know that. No matter what I'm feeling right now, I know you're not going to leave me alone. So I'm okay. I'm struggling or hurting or whatever. I'm okay. Thank you, Lord. For this lesson from you. That's what he wants us to get to them. All of a sudden, everything's good again. The confidence in his mercy, as he talks about in the devotion to the divine mercy. Dependent, to be dependent. Our own habitual disposition, habitual disposition should be dependence. Poverty, the evangelical council of poverty is also limited. Because consecrated poverty means limitation. Limitations of what we use, how we dispose of what we have. Because we should look at everything in our lives as merely borrowed from the Lord, entrusted from the Lord, everything that we have. That's why we give thanks. Lord, thank you for this less. It sounds funny, but you can do that. Lord, I mean, you know, as I've been sharing with you about my experience with the hermits. And you know, I'm a big guy. And I'm relying. I voluntarily said, I'm only going to eat what they give me. Because there's little convenience stores I could have stopped at and got some snacks. Even, you know, going out. I could have done that. Who would have known? God knows, of course. But maybe I could have made sense of it. But I wanted to do that on purpose. And I, I do remember, I'm not trying to prop myself up. I remember sitting there at the little desk and the window looking out of the forest. And I could watch the rabbits come out in the morning and in the evening to feed. The hawk that came down almost grabbed the rabbit. 
No squirrels, because I figured out because there's so many hawks. I didn't think that was rats. And the first day I was there, coming out of Holy Mass, and I'm walking down the path, and there's these two crab apple trees. And I see this huge rabbit eating. And I'm thinking, oh, this, as soon as he senses me, he's going to take over. I walked up right to him. I was able just to look. I was, I'm fascinated by him. And I just looked at him, he's chewing away on his crab. And then after a moment, he took off. I was, I was amazed. Thank you. What an experience. That was just a rabbit. But, you know, I'm from the city. I didn't have things like that. Look at amazing rabbit. And then being at my desk and getting a little bit, and then you know, literally a handful of nuts. Because here we take the can of nuts. We'll walk around and go, hmm, these are good. You know, oh yeah, these are great. And they're gone. Here I got a handful of nuts. And I remember thinking, thank you, Lord, for these peanuts. Because I, these are so good. And I ate one by one, just relishing the 20 or so peanuts that I had as I'm looking out and thanking God for the the glory of the world. Going and sitting by the creek with nothing but my walking stick and a little bottle of water. And I know you would have laughed at me as this. I'm I'm older now. I'm not 20. I'm not your age anymore. And I had to climb down the bridge to be able to sit by the creek. And I debated whether I should even do it or not. Could I get back up? Am I going to be able to climb back up? And I thought of you, I thought they would be laughing so hard watching me, climbing down, with my habit on, you know, being careful not to get it so dirty. And I did. I was able to walk around by the creek. And again, really, just saying, thank you, Lord. This is so beautiful. I love just looking at the water. Just for a moment, you know, okay. just for a few minutes. So, taking with the being dependent. Being using the limitations of what I had. So, because consecrated poverty must lack, it must do without. Because in a world, what, what must consecrated poverty be? It must want. And the only way you can do that is to lack and to do without. It must want. If we have everything, then our poverty is just paper, it's just a word. Yeah, I'm proclaiming, I, I, I bow, but I've got everything. That's why going to McDonald's should be an amazing adventure. It shouldn't be just another thing. I can remember, you know, again, we never went to the kids. We didn't know what that was. We saw the commercials. I remember, I don't even remember how great this is, how much I thought Wendy's was the most amazing place. I see the commercials on TV. And I dreamed about my dad taking me to Wendy's. I had no I, I just had no idea. But that's how our lives were as poor people. We dreamed about that. You know, literally, I couldn't remember dreaming thinking about going to Wendy's. And now we pass Wendy's up, hey, you want to hurry up. But for for us, it should be something not that you don't want to. Not that you're not hungry. Not that it would be good. Sometimes we work so hard. And then it's dinner time. Just go get some chicken or something. You really can't do that. Because we should go more. Okay. Let me catch my breath. Give me a half hour. Go have dinner. But I hate eating so late. Being poverty. Being dependent. Being limited. We must want. Either either there are limitations to what we use, to what we have, or we're not really good. That's all it is. Finally, the church tells us that, po- they, that in our law, in our in our constitution, poverty must be normative. It must be of the norm. Now, no two religious communities interpret or understand evangelical poverty exactly the same way. That's why the church puts in that law, according to your constitutions. You have to interpret that. So, the classic definition of perfect poverty goes something like this. The poverty of a community is perfect 
if it corresponds to the purpose for which that institute was founded. So, an institute founded like the Fathers of Mercy to give retreats. Father, I could never be a father of mercy because they're on the road 380, 350 days a year. Okay. Poverty for them would not be like poverty for us. They have to be out. They have to accept what's given to the people taking them to dinner. That's part of what they do. So for them, it's different. For us, even though I do do retreats, it's not so much. And you guys actually go with me like the Fatima conferences. Okay. Again, pack snacks, pack a sandwich. We're going to be there for a long time. There's going to be a lot going on. That we're poor according to who we are. And as Father founder, founded, what are, what are our cares in? The, to promote the mystery of the Immaculate Conception. The mystery, what it means. Why did God do that? What does it mean for our Lord? To promote the mystery of the Immaculate Conception. To pray every day, fervently, for the Holy Souls of Purgatory. And to be of assistance to the local pastor in whatever way. Simple. Simple. Always giving more, willing to give more, willing to talk more about the Immaculate Conception, what it means, the mystery. Willing to help those who can no longer help themselves, to help them to become immaculate so they can go to heaven. Souls of and to be catechetical in helping and assisting the local pastor in whatever he wants. And we, we look at that as the ordinary of this archdiocese, Archbishop Indian. And I tell him, whatever you want. I want him to be able to call this house, needing something, and we say, yes. That's our part. It's nothing to do with sensuous dinners, always having the refrigerator full of stuff. All of the founding charisms of all the founding are about giving. Giving. To wear yourself out. To die giving all you have, like our Lord. To where your heart is pierced and you give everything. Everything that you have. So, how? How do we practice? I think we've talked enough about that. But even in canon law, it says institutes are to make a special effort to give a collective testimony of charity and poverty. Collective, together. We give our testimony. So in other words, consecrated poverty applies to religious as persons and to religious as communities and institutes. We are to witness to Christ's presence in the world today. To be to, to the Christ who opened his public ministry by quoting from the prophet when he says about the coming of the Messiah. He would be the one who would preach the gospel to the poor. Because why? Because the poor are powerful with God. So powerful. The more poor we are, the more powerful we are with our Lord. And so we can look at our Lord and say to him, you gave us the example of the poverty we should practice. Help us, O oh dear Savior, to not only profess to be poor, but to be poor because it is the poor that you came to preach the good news. It is the poor who identify with you. It is the poor who will join you in the company of all the saints for all eternity in heaven. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit.